2017 might be one of the best years for video games. So much so that every month felt that we're getting a barrage of fantastic titles. Because of that, I'm expecting my list to be twice as long, because I believe there are some games out there that slip through the cracks that also deserve a little bit of the spotlight. Let me just set a few rules before we start, though. The first, which you're probably familiar with, no remix or ports, which this year it's rather a shame because I would have loved to talk about the Crash and Saint trilogy, but rules are rules. Second is that, well, I haven't played everything under the sun. Even though the list is definitely bigger, it doesn't mean I had time to pretty much mess with everything. So some of the games I missed are right here, which I wish I could have included, but, you know, time. And of course, it's my opinion, and you're definitely gonna disagree with this list, but instead of being mean about it, just write in the comments what games you liked. Buckle up your seats, everyone. It's time for my top 20 games of 2017. Oh boy, what did I get myself into? say that the Nintendo Switch became the darling of 2017. Not only that it's a vast improvement over their clunky predecessor, but I do think it's an amazing hybrid between console and handheld, so much so it's probably my favorite gimmick Nintendo has done ever, I must say. And the fact that it's sold very well means that the user base is definitely bigger, which means I can actually play online against multiple people in games like Splatoon 2. Bolstering some new weapons and a couple of new modes like Salmaron, Splatoon 2 remains a fun multiplayer shooter that we all know and love. Not to mention that the single player campaign is also pretty fun. I would rave about it more, but the main issue I got is that it does feel like deja vu. I do of course like the music, the charming writing, but it still feels like more of the same old Splatoon that it kind of feels like a deluxe version. Like, you know, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Which is probably one of the most fun games I've played all year on the Switch, so I kind of want to give it a nod. Uh... You know what, both of those games are going to share this entry now because my list... It is hard for me to describe how Blade Senua's sacrifice without sounding negative about it, despite the fact this is exactly what the game was going for. The independent game by Ninja Theory pits Senua as she journeys into a bleak and harrowing world, although the real challenge lies within her mind. The game serves as a metaphor for psychosis, as Senua keeps being pestered by voices that downright berates her throughout the entire game. For every step I took in Hellblade, I just fret dread and anxiety the whole entire time, and I felt that even in combat my life was incredibly fleeting. And none of this could have worked if it weren't for Melina Jurgensen's amazing performance. And she was originally Ninja Theory's video editor. You did this. No! No! And when you also take into account the phenomenal sound design, it's no surprise how many accolades Hellblade has gotten so far. It's a cerebral game that will challenge you, and while you won't leave away with a smile, it doesn't make it any less of a groundbreaking experience. Steamwall Dig 2 is pretty much what happens when we take Terraria and add more RPG and platforming elements to it. With the mysterious disappearance of the lead character from the last game, Rusty, it's up for his pal Dorothy to find out his whereabouts and discover a conspiracy in the process. While the story is better, the star of course is the gameplay. Going deep underground, mining for resources, coming back and then exchanging them for currency to buy more upgrades, 
may sound like a chore, but thanks to the tight controls and brisk pace is a second nature and becomes incredibly addicting. While I played it on the PS4, I actually recommend it try that on the Nintendo Switch because I think this game is perfect for that pick up and play mentality. Steamwall Dig 2 is terrific, and if you still doubt its placement on the list, well, this game has a hookshot and a jetpack. And that's mandatory list material right there, it has to be on. Tekken 7 I really wanted to love Tekken 7, but when you remove core features like team battle, it's hard for me to like you. So in this fighting game juggernaut match, I'm giving it to Injustice 2. For one, this story mode proves that NetherRealm Studios are eons above any other company when it comes to both the writing and acting. But even more so, it features some of the best facial animations in a video game this side of LA Noir. There are a lot of DC superheroes and villains to choose from, and each one of them has their own unique moveset, and one jaw-dropping super move that pretty much shatters the fabric of reality. While I don't think it's a huge step up from its predecessor, I do think that Injustice 2 is a very fun fighting game. If anything, it's a terrific palate cleanser after Justice League. <laughs> Despite the low placement on this list, not only I think that South Park The Fractured Butt Hole is better than the last couple of seasons of the show, but personally, I enjoyed it more than The Stick of Truth. Now, I know it's a controversial opinion, but trust me, I have a couple reasons to back it up. For one, I just prefer the superhero setting since the Coon and Friends were some of my favorite episodes of South Park, and I just like superheroes in general. The other reason? I just like the combat much more. The turn-based grid system reminded me a lot of Mega Man Battle Network, but in all the good ways, since you can also choose your own superhero class and see how it meshes with the other characters in the game. While I did like roaming around the daytime and doing all the side missions, the real fun in the game lies in the crazy night missions, because that's when the story gets really good. There are so many other things I would like to discuss about Fractured Butthole, but Due to the mature content, I need to refrain myself, but if you are of the right age, I highly recommend you go to South Park to have yourself a time. Didn't I say that before when I talked about South Park? After its successful Kickstarter campaign, it was pretty easy to see why people were looking forward to Ukulele, but after the mediocre reviews, let's just say that people were disappointed. But I do like 3D platformers, so that's the reason why I'm giving this spot to Ahead in Time. I never played any of the betas of this game, but I was captivated from the very start. Everything from how adorable Had Kid's reactions are, to how unique each chapter looks and plays. Chapter 2 alone is a standard for having to help two bickering directors by becoming a star in their movies? That right there is Paper Mario territory of great writing. I also want to give a shout out to the voice acting which was surprisingly very amusing and I did chuckle in many spots. And it's also very cool that I actually know some of the people in the cast. Special shout out to a good friend of mine, Ali Monty, who voiced Mustache Girl. Are you ready to take down some Mafia? Let's do it! I'm psyched! And I know some people might not like the placement of this game, but it's mostly due to some issues I had with the controls. Especially when I miss those tightropes every single time. Also, not a big fan of the third world, which is sadly a quarter of the game. But even with those nitpicks, I had in time is beloved by many for a reason. I really hope the game garnered a moderate success so this becomes a franchise. And considering this is all coming from a small team, the only thing I got to say is... Hats off to them. This, this is what I wanted Uncharted 4 to be like. I know I gave that game number 7 of 2016, but that was mostly because in retrospect, that year as a whole was rather underwhelming. 
Lost Legacy, despite of its seemingly low placement, is a vast improvement over the fourth installment, which is hard to believe since it was originally supposed to be just mere DLC. Fan favorite Chloe Fraser takes over lead character duties alongside Nadine Ross from the last game, and the two share a much more interesting dynamic than Nathan Drake and his bore of a brother ever did. Every single chapter, from the bustling streets of India all the way to the final train sequence, are absolutely exhilarating. But the highlight is chapter 4, where the game puts you in a confined area, and you pretty much have to use a map to figure out what to do next, and there is even a cool side quest in which you can get an optional item that helps treasure hunting, which is usually the most boring part of those games, actually fun to partake in. The game may be short, but it never overstays its welcome. And if this is the direction that the series is going with Chloe at the helm, I'm more than happy to embark on another adventure. Okay, I'm coming clean. I haven't finished this game yet, so that probably explains why this place is somewhat low. But even then, I should give this game the proper praise it deserves. In an age where turn-based Japanese RPGs seem to be completely passé, it's really nice to see Persona 5 not only rejuvenate that genre, but also inject it with style. And oh boy is this game stylish. Not only the anime-inspired graphics are absolutely beautiful, but the menus are perhaps the best of any game in recent memory. So much so that the battle UI has become a meme on its own around the internet. Even though, like the rest of the franchise, I do think the story starts off rather slow, thankfully the wonderful cast of characters are so engaging that I just kept pushing through. Lastly, the soundtrack. Oh my god, is it good. I would usually go on a spiel as to why, but honestly, all you need is just to listen to Last Surprise. You never see it coming. Oh boy, is Wolfenstein 2 a gut punch. Even though I think that the New Order overall had better level design and more interesting places to explore, the New Colossus is still a very enjoyable game. The continuing adventures of BJ Blazkowicz took a turn for the worse, as the Nazis won World War II and our main protagonist is now weaker than ever. The game does not shy away from showing you how tormented he actually is by tackling some really harsh subject matters like domestic abuse that feel very adult and genuine. And while those moments felt real on the other side of the coin, Wolfenstein 2 features some of the most bonkers moments I've seen in a video game ever in my life. Okay, here's my pitch. Even if you don't like first-person shooter games in particular, let alone play their original game, I highly recommend just playing Wolfenstein 2 on easy mode, because in my humble opinion, it has the best story in any first-person shooter game I have ever played. And I guarantee there's gonna be at least one moment in this game that'll make your mouth open wide. Does it top the holy trinity of the FPSs from last year? No. But I do think it's the best shooter of 2017. Grace told me that you know a way into the Oberkommando. You get me in there, I will use this nuke to blow the top brass of the Nazi leadership to smithereens. Yes! Yes, of course! That sounds so good. I'm not all that big into the Assassin's Creed franchise since the only game that I truly loved was 2, but Origins might be the best game since. For one, the series finally has a new likable protagonist in the form of Bayek. Not only he delivers his lines with genuine charm and confidence, but his story with his young son and wife is the crux of the whole game and is what holds the entire narrative together. Aside from that, Origins feels like a first real evolution to the series' formula. While you can still climb on towers to unlock markers on the map, at least the location themselves feel more expensive and visually interesting. The world is a joy to explore, from the arid deserts, the quaint cities, to the many tombs that you can raid. The combat is vastly improved, 
Now with a new leveling up system that includes a handy skill tree with new abilities for Bayek to learn, like using his pet hawk to harass enemies. It isn't perfect, but Assassin's Creed Origins is a major step up for the franchise that has been stagnating for quite a while now, and if Ubisoft keeps up with this, I'm all on board. Just no more Animus storyline, please. Like, ever. I'm pretty sure that many of you are probably disappointed that Silent Hills is never gonna come out because Konami. But if you really want to get your first person horror fix, I highly recommend Resident Evil 7. This game is a return to form after the shift to a more action based gameplay that 4 helped revolutionize. It's really fascinating to see Resident Evil return to a more humble roots where you just have a spooky mansion to explore, and thankfully now with better controls and first person aiming that works remarkably well. It harkens back to the days with limited ammo, unique puzzles, and of course the tight level design that makes backtracking actually engaging. Even the story is more effective this time around because the main character Ethan isn't some badass special agent, and his opposition, the Baker family, pose an insurmountable threat. Jack Baker alone is a reason to own this game. He is terrifying, sure, but not without the campy charm the series is known for. Welcome to the family, son. What really surprised me is that as much as I like this game, apparently the VR is the preferred method to play it. But if I want to ensure that my bowels stay in my body, yeah, I'm gonna skip it. It's funny how I own every single game in the Yakuza series, yet I've never sat down and played any of them. Lucky for me that Yakuza 0 came out last year, and I can experience the tale of Kazuma Kiryu from its first chronological point. Since the game takes place in the late 80s, it's pretty interesting to see the humble beginnings of Kazuma Kiryu, but the real star of the show is the other playable character, Goro Majima. I don't know much about him, apparently he's getting much more insane as the series goes on, but let's just say every scene he's in is electrifying. While I do think the cutin can be a little bit wordy and lengthy at times, it doesn't detract from how expertly directed they are, not to mention the fantastic acting. It's kind of funny too when a scenes can be dramatic like this, and then shift to this. It's even more amazing that even the sub-stories of this game can be engaging, from helping a girl pretending to be her boyfriend to assisting a rock band to become tougher. As for the gameplay, Yakuza 0 is by far the most badass game on this list. I have never played a brawl that has such visceral and outlandish moves, and each time I perform a hit action, I'm just astonished of what's going on screen. What's even more amazing is the sheer amount of side activities from playing pool, darts, and even classic arcade games. Yakuza 0 may not be for everyone, but this is a perfect starting point if you were ever curious about this cult classic. This shouldn't work. This, on all accounts and purposes, shouldn't have been as good as it actually is. I am not a big fan of the rabbits at all. To me, they pretty much annoy me ever since they took the spotlight in Raymond Raving Rabbits, and they're pretty much the clue of the minions from Despicable Me. And yet, leave it to an endorsement by Shigeru Miyamoto and a very passionate director, and I had to give this game a shot, and well... I love it! A lot of people call this game XCOM Lite, but I do think it undersells it despite the fact of how easy it is to get into. What I love about this game is that no turn feels wasted, and the fact you can use other characters to perform jumping combos in order to move more efficiently around the map makes it far more enjoyable than it has any right to be. Pulling off satisfying combos with multiple abilities is one of the most satisfying gaming experiences I've had all year. 
In addition, the exploration segments between the action are charming, with many puzzles to solve, and even the humor is actually funny, which I wasn't expecting from a Rabbids game. The orchestral soundtrack is terrific thanks to Grant Kirkhope, because if there is anyone else that would touch the Mario soundtrack, leave it to the guy who did Banjo-Kazooie. The game is far from perfect, as I do think some characters are pretty awful like PRINCESS PETCH! But considering all the bad rap the rabbits gotten over the years, and the fact that really no one was expecting this to be good to begin with, this is by far the biggest surprise of 2017, and I highly recommend it. idea what to expect from Nier Automata. I didn't know who Yoko Taro was by name, let alone played any of his previous games because of their shoddy critical reception. But let Platinum Games help him out, and our crazy tour finally got himself a game that I can say is downright near perfect. I like the setting in which humanity has long abandoned Earth because of all the dangers on the planet, and androids are now the force that pretty much have to eradicate said danger so the Earth can become inhabitable again. And while the goal might seem simple for 2B and her companion 9S, it's anything but. The game quickly goes to Kojima levels of insanity as the story goes on, and yet it is very profound and touching. The narrative is the driving force of the game, as it does raise a lot of questions regarding humanity, existentialism, and even, uh, reproduction? But as I stated, none of this would work if the gameplay wasn't fun, and while it's no bane at a level, the combat is definitely flowing and fast-paced. There are even moments when the game becomes a 2D shooter and unleashing all the firepower on a giant boss is immensely satisfying. I highly recommend you should pick Nier Automata up, but if you need any further convincing... Romeo and Juliet. It's safe to say that Nintendo had an amazing 2017, and even Sony wasn't a slouch, but Microsoft, not so much. For the record, I do not dislike Microsoft. In fact, I did buy an Xbox One X last year after selling my original system. I just wish the machine had more original titles to justify my purchase, but unfortunately Microsoft's lineup was very dull. Except, of course, one game that you all know that took the entire internet by storm, and that is not other than a cup of... Cuphead. I think what makes Cuphead such a phenomenal game is how the graphics and gameplay complement each other perfectly. Yes, Cuphead is tough, and I died a lot, but the controls are precise and pitch perfect, and I never felt cheated because I was able to learn every single pattern. But the reason why I plowed through this game despite how many times I met my demise is because I really wanted to see what's gonna come up in the next level. The creativity on display throughout the game's many levels and bosses encouraged me to try harder just so I can witness everything it had to offer. And when I did beat a boss, the sense of fulfillment felt absolutely unparalleled. The creators of this game, the Moldenhauer brothers, actually had to mortgage their house just so they can finish this game. And you can tell that they and their team put a lot of effort into every single frame of animation. Not to mention that the jazzy soundtrack is absolutely great and definitely gets your blood pumping. If anything, I am glad this game is a major success, because this team absolutely earned it.
I know that some of you might be upset that Super Mario Odyssey is not number one, but then again, I would consider the top seven to be masterclass in their own respective genre, and there is no doubt that Mario is the maestro of 3D platformers. Super Mario Odyssey's controls are absolutely perfect. They are precise and they give you so much maneuverability that is close to perfection. Using Cappy is incredibly fun, even if I wish it didn't really rely so much on motion controls, and the possession ability is so much fun to use. Anything from controlling Koopas, Goombas, Pokio the Flingy Bird, which honestly needs its own game, and of course, meat. Just meat. Combine that with a vast variety of worlds to explore and a ridiculous amount of secrets to uncover with the most obscure Mario references yet, it's hard to not fall in love with this game. It even had one of my favorite moments of the entire year when I finally got to New Dong City. You know what I'm talking about. While I do wish the game had more traditional platforming segments like in Mario Galaxy, and I don't think every world was amazing, I can't deny that Nintendo did make something special. If you own a Nintendo Switch, this must be in your collection. Seventeen is going to be remembered as Blank is the Dark Souls of Blank, like Crash the Insane Trilogy is the Dark Souls of Platformers. But there was one game that captured the Dark Souls formula to a T that I wish got more recognition. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the point of the video where I'm gonna gush over... Neo. Neo, not to be confused with the protagonist of the Matrix franchise, is an action game set in feudal Japan, imbued with yokai folklore and other mystical elements. What makes it different than Dark Souls is the fact that this game is much faster, which makes a lot of sense since it's made by Team Ninja, the people who gave us Ninja Gaiden. But even with the pedigree that this game has, I was not expecting such variety from the combat. Ninja magic and cool items notwithstanding, I'm just shocked with the fact that despite how many weapons you get, each one of them has three different stances that affect not only your movement, but the kind of attacks you can use, making the combat incredibly dynamic. While there are many ways to beat enemies, it doesn't change the fact that the game is extremely tough, and you will die a lot. I can keep gushing about the bosses, the levels, and the weapons, but at the end of the day, Neo was the game I spent the most time on in 2017, concerning how lengthy the whole experience was. Honestly, I wish this didn't come out in 2017, so it actually got some recognition during the best of the year discussions from other publications. But this is my platform to say that you must try Neo out. If you love Japanese mythology and fast-paced action games that can be a little bit difficult at times yet fulfilling, Neo is an absolute masterpiece. Horizon Zero Dawn was definitely a pleasant surprise. No one was expecting Guerrilla Games, the makers of the Killzone series, to make an action-adventure game, but lo and behold, they knocked it out of the park. Horizon has, by far, my favorite setting in a video game this year. It takes place in the far future, but humanity lives in primitive tribes because they dread technology so much. There's a lot of mystery and intrigue as to what happened to that old world, and in the center of it there is Aloy, a young girl with an interesting past that might be connected to everything. But beside the mystery, there are other reasons why I love this game so much. Let me cut to the chase, did you see how beautiful this game is? I don't even have a 4K TV and it looks absolutely gorgeous! I have played my fair share of open world games, but very few of them pit me against giant robotic animals. And using your bow and arrow alongside useful traps makes hunting all those exotic creatures all the more exhilarating. I especially loved climbing the Tolnix because they're basically a moving version of the towers from the Assassin's Creed games, and they definitely breathe new life to the salt cliché. I don't say stuff like this often, and well, it might be considered hyperbole, but... As a PS4 owner for more than four years, 
in my opinion, Horizon Zero Dawn is the best exclusive on the PlayStation 4. If you don't know the system yet and you always want to get one, this must be in your collection. This game is an enthralling experience and I recommend everyone to venture towards the horizon. I admit I had many concerns going into Breath of the Wild. The biggest being the shift to an open world design and making it feel more like Skyrim than, say, Zelda. But those concerns were put to rest the moment I got the paraglider, and I finally got to explore this amazing world brought to us by the visionaries from Nintendo. The thing about Breath of the Wild is despite its size, there is so much to do on every inch in Hyrule that it's hard to ever get bored from completing the many shrines that feature some mind-bending puzzles that are all extremely unique, to finding some amazing secrets including the very elusive Koroks. I don't think the combat gets enough credit, but pulling off a slow-mo flurry attack was one of the most fun things I've ever done in any Zelda game. And yeah, I do admit that weapon durability is an issue. But then again, the world is so organic that you can solve problems in so many unique ways that it didn't really bother me. It's the kind of game that I wish I could talk about more, but honestly, it's about you as the player making your own experience in this wonderful world. I think only time will tell if this is my favorite game in the franchise, but I do think it's safe to say that Breath of the Wild is nothing short of legendary. Usually I do a fake out, but you've been watching this video for 30 minutes and I can imagine you know what this is going to be, so let's just do it. SEGA! I love Sonic Mania! Sonic Mania is as close to a perfect Sonic game I could ever ask for. And thank god for that, because usually, Sonic forces some kind of a random gimmick we just don't like! Thanks to the efforts of Christian Whitehead, Simon Tomley, and the other talented developers who were originally part of the Sonic fan game community, they concocted a game that far transcends just being a mere fan creation. It's one thing to capture the visual style of the Genesis games, but it's another to ensure the controls are spot on. But Mania not only did that, but also added the cool drop dash move that allows you to boost midair. And while the new levels are by far the highlight of this game, the older levels get enough new twists and mechanics to make them feel fresh as they did two decades ago. Even a previously generic level like Metallic Manus has a lot of neat surprises in store. It has perhaps the best special stages in Sonic history, and playing as Tails and Knuckles is also extremely fun. And the music, oh god, the music, I love it. T Lopes, you have composed my favorite soundtrack of 2017. So much though, I actually bought the vinyl record of it. That's how much. But really, why is it number one? Well, here is the thing. Sonic Mania is a sequel I always wanted to my favorite game of all time, Sonic 3 and Knuckles, a game that helped me a lot during my childhood to put a smile on my face whenever I had a bad day at school. Sonic Mania is the closest game to have captured that essence. A game I find myself playing throughout the year because I need to let off some steam. It brought me back to a much more innocent and magical time when I was really anticipating a game. I remember August 14th and seeing the countdown to where I can finally play it and when it finally hit zero I never pressed X so fast in my life and I pretty much plowed through the game in about 5 hours in one single sitting. It was such a wonderful time that brought me back to my childhood. And it's also delightful to tell other people that I love Sonic Mania and I'm not scoffed or ridiculed for enjoying the franchise. And yes, I know that Sonic Forces came out and that game wasn't very good. 
But Sonic Mania wasn't only admired by the fans, but people who actually work as professionals in video game journalism, and that to me is a huge deal. The reason why I make top lists every year is because I enjoy video games so much. And because they brought me so much joy, I'd like to award the best of the best. In perhaps one of the best years in video game history, it is more than an honor for me to award Sonic Mania as my number one game of 2017. Okay, this technically couldn't be a part of the list, but uh, can I just include the Switch Pro Controller Xenoblade 2 style? I mean, just look at it, it's so, it's so incredibly cool. I mean, how can you say no to this thing? It's, 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 it's pretty. I would like to thank every single one of you who watched the entirety of this video, and if you can leave a like, it will be incredibly helpful, and of course, please subscribe. I was also included in EPN's Best of 2017 video, so if you want to watch those, and until the next time, take care.